Hello, everyone. My guest today is Asaf Wan. He's a co-founder and CEO of InsurTech startup Hippo. Based in Palo Alto, the company is modernizing home insurance through the lens of homeowners. All right, Asaf, you ready to take us to the top? Bring it. What okay. do you want to so you got Hippo going on here. Now, listen, my audience is usually pure SaaS. So let me just ask you, your revenue model, is it pure SaaS? Or, or if not, what is the revenue model? So the revenue model is, is commission-driven. We basically make uh, percentages of every premium that we actually sell. However, uh, because you mentioned that your, your audience is mostly SaaS, think of insurance as one of the most interesting SaaS businesses you can find. I get yearly pay, the average policy, I think it's like $1,200. So I get an yearly pay of $1,200 from you where I'm get, making my commission. The churn is really, really minimal, you know, because you didn't change your uh, home insurance very, very often. However, uh, it's a business that actually have the market and the marketing capabilities of a consumer side. So you can mm-hmm. target customers directly. The side is... A hundred billion dollar and go in at five billion dollars a year. So you get the positive side of consumer, uh, basically businesses, with the benefit of a SaaS business. Mm-hmm. So break break this down for me. Is that twelve hundred number you just gave me? Is that a fair average in terms of what consumers pay you per year for their home insurance? That that's that's the average in the U.S. Okay, in the U.S. and and how many and how many of these how many of these do you have issued at this point? Outstanding. North of 150, 160,000. Okay, 100, like quite significant. Yeah, it's significant. Okay, right, 160,000. We'll talk more about that here in a second. But break down the economics on the 1,200. So that's the pay to you. Now, is that top line revenue or do you have to pay a yeah, bunch of that top, back? So that's top line and we're making uh, percentages out of that. Okay, and do you negotiate, your BD team negotiates the percentages based off the sales channel one, one by one? Uh, we we are agnostic. We always get the same commission, the same structure, no matter what. Oh, so I'm not going to do. Uh, uh, it's mostly to focus on the customer. So the customer would not feel that if he comes from channel A, he potentially got a different price, or someone else got a different cut. We're agnostic. No matter what channel you're coming to, Epo, we're always making the same pay, and you as a customer always pays the same amount. Okay, so what are you making on the 1,200? We're talking like 10 percent or more? No, no, quite significantly more. What, okay, what, can, can you give me a range? It's in the uh, twenty to thirty percent. Okay, and how did I? I'm just uneducated here. How does that compare to traditional home insurance? Oh, it's a, it's the same structure. Like the uh, fifteen percent commission because we're doing a lot more than what any other agent doing. We're collecting the data. We have our policy management. It's our own filing. It's our own product. Uh, so our cut is quite significantly better. You're also uh, doing everything that you need. So now an agent is not gonna take care of you on the claims. The claims move to the claim department in the insurance. We have our own claim department. We're doing all of that stuff. We're basically, uh, think of it as a virtual insurance company for for an ease of thought. A soft 1,200 per year where you're taking your minimum of the range you gave me of 20% is essentially 240 bucks per year to you or about 20 bucks a month across 160,000 paying customers. That puts your monthly recurring revenue at somewhere around 3.2 million on this stream. Is that accurate? It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, let's not get into it. It's, it's actually quite significantly higher than that. Okay. We also have other products, uh, auto, flood, there's all kinds of other components as well that are coming in. Yes. Are, are all of these additional products that drive that, it, driving expansion revenue on that same cons- customer base or these are, or you're serving these, cu- these products to different customers entirely? Customer base. Different? Same. Oh, same. Okay, so so I, I want to walk through a life cycle here. So you get me on the insurance twelve hundred per year. Talk to me about your other products that you might upsell me in years two and three, two, three, four. No, it's even most of them are in the same time. If you are living in a flood zone, we'll sell you a flood insurance. We're obligated to offer you an earthquake insurance in California. Different states have different products that are mandatory to offer you, and we offer them and we sell them. Uh, we are a lot less focused on upselling. This is not our focus. Our focus is whatever is best for the customer. But some customers want to bundle and, offer and, and add the auto. We're happy to offer that. It's a very customer-centric rather than maximizing revenue per customer. It's about growth. If we're you know, in the region of 200,000 customers now, there are 120 million households in the U.S. There's so much more to go by focusing on getting more incremental revenue rather than adding upselling opportunities. Sorry, are you at 160,000 customers or 200,000 across all your products? You know, it's in between-ish. 
So you have about 40,000 that might not pay at all for the home insurance, but they're paying for just earthquake or just flood or something else. No, no, no. It's like it's just that the pace of the growth is so high. We acquire the company. There's so many other moving parts of the, of the you know, the business. So the specific number of how many customers is is a moving target. This business in terms of valuation, you know, churn is obviously critical. You mentioned churn was fairly low. If you look at the past 12 months in terms of gross revenue churn, are you in the single digit percentage range? Yes. OK, so under 10 percent annual gross revenue churn. Which is uh, overall the standard for insurance in general. When was the last time you replaced your home insurance? Can I can I be honest with you? I have no idea if I even have home insurance. I hate all this administrative stuff. Some my, my family office takes care of this stuff for me. <laughs> as long as you have a mortgage on your home on your home, you have a uh, home insurance. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So call it 10% gross revenue turn annually or lower. Now, I know, you know, obviously if you drive activation of these users, you upsell them on things. Do you have expansion revenue that more than makes up for that 10% hole? And it's it's uh it's, 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 as I told you, it's a lot less of a focus area. No, no, also, off, but that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very CEO answer of you, which I appreciate. But you, if you tie customer value to your pricing, you then directly align customer value with your revenue. So I'm going to push you a bit harder here. Do you have upsell revenue that more than makes up for the 10% loss? So your net revenue retention is above hundred percent. There's also a price increase, which is embedded in every home insurance policy. So a standard increase in a home insurance uh, policy yearly is around four to five percent and that's just because the risk associated with your home keep on increasing because an extra year passed and the plumbing is a year older and the you know and stuff like that so you need to compensate for the ex- extra risk uh, plus people are actually adding to those more change and, and change up in your house because you probably added a deck changed the kitchen bought new stuff for your for your house so People have a tendency to accumulate and, and, and increase the size of the home. So that also pushes up the, the, the prices. So it kind of mitigates that. And the upselling stuff, which we're not, as I, as I told you, we are not focused on that, is usually it's a wash because most of the sales that we're doing on the upsell is a day one rather than try and keep on pushing your stuff ongoing. Got it. So you're, I'm going to decode this, but I'm, you tell me if I'm decoding accurately here. Uh, you churn maximum 10%. You sell most of the stuff on day one. There's not a lot of upsell motion happening here, except the natural 5% accelerators in the home insurance programs with risks that's associated over time. So you have somewhere between call it 90% and hundred percent net revenue retention annually. Yeah, you can, you can basically frame it. Like What's that. the team size today? How many people? It's 150 people. Uh, split between three offices. We have a Palo Alto office of around 65 people. We have the biggest office for repo is Austin, where we have all of our insurance operation, our agents, our claims, our billing, all of that kind of servicing. And then we have a company that we acquired that is based in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Okay. Around, you know, 65 in here and I don't know, 85 in the other. Okay. How many of the, the how many of the total folks are engineers? Sorry again, it how, got cut off. How many of your folks are engineers? Uh, 30-ish to 40-ish. Okay, 30 to 40. If you, you, you put UI, you put BI, you, it depends on you know the definition, but it's around 30-ish to 40. And, and any quota carrying salespeople? No, we don't We don't use quotes in general. Like uh, It's not something, our call center and agents are basically our frontline people. And they don't have a quote. I don't mind if they spend, you know, with Nathan an hour and a half and tell you that your actual insurance with farmers is good. I'm completely fine. Even with that, because we automated a lot of the stuff because we choose very specific, empathetic people. Uh, you know, my guess is they're selling 3x what the industry average for for an agent is. Yep. So most of this stuff that you're doing is really, it's no touch online kind of stuff. There's It's not an expensive enough product for you to afford to put real touch on it. Is that accurate? Plus uh, channels. We have a lot of channels that are actually selling. Yeah. And you play commissions there, correct? Yeah. Um, You've raised some capital to do this. How much raised to date? $209 million. That's a lot of dilution. Why couldn't you build this without raising so much? It's not a lot of dilution. Depends on the valuation, no? Yeah, I'm uh, gonna I, I, based off some information that I have. Uh, I'm gonna say that uh, it, there is definitely more dilution than if you hadn't raised any capital. How about that? 
So yeah, you go, uh, uh, but seriously, that I mean, why do you need that much money? It's the, the, the simple reasons for different funding rounds. Uh, it's not just about how much money you need. It's about the ability to have more aggressive moves. If we want to acquire companies, if we want to take some of the risk on ourselves, uh, if we want to enter other adjacencies and stuff like that, it enables us to do a lot of stuff. Also, personally, uh, and maybe I'm off, I am less optimistic about the macro climate at 2020, and I prefer to sit on slightly more cash than to be more constrained. Yeah. When you... Again, I'm not familiar with insurance like I am with B2B SaaS. So I know when a SaaS company wants to drive up burn to drive growth, I know where they're going to spend it. I'm not quite sure where you would spend money to drive growth unless you're doing big acquisitions. Uh, are you spending money? And besides acquisitions, is there what, what can you spend more money on to basically make more money internally? It's, it's about doubling down on, on our channels. It's about uh, basically, it's a 50 states regulations. So you have 50 regulators. You can't sell everywhere, put aside globally. You can't even sell all throughout the U.S. You need to file and get admitted state by state. That cost, uh, we're at a point where we are doubling down on, on our customers. So we give every customer of Hippo an IoT device, basic package that have a bunch of sensors that prevent losses. That's oh, there's a hardware. There's a hardware component to this. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. So if I'm a homeowner and I buy $1,200 uh, per year insurance from you, what am I going to have to spend on the IoT device? Oh, it's, uh, we, we, we're paying for it. You're not paying a dollar for that. What does it cost you for my one home? Uh, it's, uh, I, you know, I have an NDA with my suppliers, but it costs. It cost. Well, I mean, no, sorry. I just have no idea. I mean, are you talking like five bucks or $5,000? Uh, it's not, not that and not that. It's in the, in the high tens of dollars. Oh, okay, 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 okay. But you, basically what you're saying is you have to subsidize that, your subs yes. all that cost. We also uh, are so focused on the customers. So I'll, 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 I'll flip it around to, to kind of like explain something on Hippo. Think about your current insurance experience. You have a shitty experience now at day one for onboarding, and you have a shitty experience at year nine when you have a claim. And in between, companies forgot that you're a customer. We are also mm -hmm. focused on this nine-year time frame on basically bringing Nathan value. So we give you IoT device, but we're also sending someone to your home once a year or twice a year to clean your gutters, check your air filters, uh, basically do a checkup of your home on you know the plumbing, the electricity, the, the sockets, and all of that kind of stuff. That costs us money. It comes back uh, because it lowers our loss ratio because we actually prevent losses but because of that. But that's a longer term play versus a short term acquisition aspect. So, so if you look at your total servicing like costs on a twelve hundred dollar a year contract, what does that come out to? It, it varies. It, it, it's also about scale. It's about, it's about density. It's about locations. Uh, it's 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 more complex than just. And we're doing different services in different places. We might send someone to basically rake leaves in the northeast, and we might send someone to uh, clean gutters. And these are two very different costs. Our data sources can show that Nathan uh, House have, you know, a satellite imagery can show that you have a potential for a water leak. So I'll send a roofer. That costs very different. Is that roofer on your P and L every month as a salary, or it's a contractor? Third party contractor. I, I can't have a coverage on even the 17, 18 states that we're in. I can't have a, a roofer on my staff to, to service Sacramento and LA at the same time. Why are you not? I mean, you must be in acquisition talks right now to buy one of these big marketplaces that basically deploy these contractors anywhere in the U.S. I've interviewed a bunch of them for the show. When are you going to acquire one of them? It's, uh, it's less of our focus. Why not? I, it sounds like that's a big part of your expense. It's, But I prefer to outsource it in, in that way and not make commission on that. Plus, I, I do not trust the quality of service of the personnel that are sending. And it's a very difficult, because if I'm sending someone to your home, from my standpoint, it's a hippo experience. And if I don't know what plumber came and he wasn't treating you nicely and he didn't do a good enough oh, no, job. No, you would own the marketplace, Asaf. That's my point. You would own the marketplace, drive your costs down and quality it, control. It's not the service providers. And to, to, uh, and because you know owning the marketplace and not owning the, the service providers, there's a detachment. And I can do it. I'm, I'm fine paying someone to actually find it. I just want the, the right quality of service. 
So I prefer to actually work with a specific service providers rather than the marketplaces. You feel like you can actually source better quality by just tapping a lot of different marketplaces versus owning one marketplace. We can define a, 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 you know, a stricter quality of service. We can vet the people. We can put another layer on top of these marketplaces yeah. to basically make sure that we can give the service that we want. For how many, customers. how you mentioned you're growing pretty quickly here. You said 150,000 today, maybe 200,000 soon. How many customers are you adding per month right now? Uh, between X and Y. Okay, what's X and what's Y? A number and a number. It's like, you know, it's a private company, so we're, we're not sharing these you things. Can, you can give me a range, but you're talking between ten and 50,000 new a month? Between 10,000 to 100,000. New a month. Okay, fair enough. He's being coy. If I'm going to guess, guys, I'm going to say it's somewhere around 20,000 a month. He just threw in 100 grand to make it sound a little bit bigger, but that's cool. Asaf, <laughs> I get it. You got to sell the vision. All right. So listen, if you're selling between 10,000, let's do 10,000 a minimum and these hardware components, right? Cost you said high tens of dollars, right? That's let's say it's a hundred bucks maximum right there. That's a million dollars in burn per month, just on hardware expense with what you've raised on your last round. How many months of runway does that give you? Uh, we we uh, almost unlimited. Okay. Uh, I mean, I guess what I'm at, what are you comfortable growing your burn? I mean, are you comfortable growing burn to 10 million bucks a month or 5 million? What, what are you, what can you sleep at night with? No, it's, it's, it's about uses of capital rather than uh, burn. Like I, I'll, I'll spend as much money on CAC as long as it fits the CAC numbers that I'm, I, I want to do. I'll spend as much money, you know, basically on the hardware as long as I think that the value for the company is, is such that it makes sense. So what is your fully weighted CAC then? To get a $1,200 kind of premium from one customer, what do you pay to get them? Between X and Y, this is a very uh, you know specific number of the company. Are you, I mean, by the way, you guys asked Drew and Reach to come out to come on the show. I do this with every CEO, so I'm not surprising you. Uh, I, it's just that, you know, some of these numbers, the number of, you know, it's, it's still a private company, the CAC, the, the number of customers that we're adding monthly, all of that kind of stuff is a very... Yeah, but Asaf, you can't pick and choose. So your press people gave me all the fluffy duffy numbers, right? I'm not going to just sit here and my job is not to make you look good. My goal is to get your real story. <laughs> I can pick and choose what I'm answering. It's still... Uh, that, 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 that's, that, that, that's fine. But so when you say, right, that you're, you're really good when it comes around to CAC, I'm then going to ask the CAC question to get out of from fluffy duffy to real data. So I guess we'll, we'll try and quantify this in a range, right? I mean, are you comfortable optimizing for a 12 month payback or have you been able to go up to 24 month payback because you've raised so much additional capital? You have more of a buffer. Uh, we, we, we don't change, we don't change the, basically the calculation and, and the way that we're spending our money because we raise more money. This is not sustainable. So it's not about just to show top line growth. And if it's not sustainable and fits our CAC models. Now, one of the interesting things that uh, would be interesting for you is that 70 to 80 percent of the customers are actually paying a year in advance. And this is how it's usually done with insurance. So there's a lot of benefits for the cash flow of the business. Of course, of on a cash basis. But on a, on a, if you do kind of gap financing and you actually defer that over to 12 months, obviously your, your, your CAC will look a little bit different. I'm just trying to get a sense of how aggressive as a CEO you're being. Are you cool with a 12 month payback period? I have no, no problem with these things. Like it's, uh, we're, we're relatively conservative. And I think if you are too loose with the money, then you're not really creating IP or differentiation. If my marketing, you know, if my marketing folks are just going to increase the spend, then we haven't created anything. You create IP by being actually a lot more frugal and a lot more constrained. Yep. Uh, your press people told me the last round was a series C for 160 million and that brought valuation north of a billion. Is that accurate? No, it was a round D of a hundred million dollars at a billion dollar valuation. Okay. Again, I am, uh, Oh, got it. Sorry. That was better.com. You compete directly with better. No, we actually work with him. Okay. You work directly with better. So sorry, th those numbers are not your numbers. Your total funding today is 209 million. And what, sorry, what valuation did you raise at? Billion. Okay, north of a billion. And was all of that going towards operations or was any of that secondary for early investors? There were components of secondaries, but it's not part of this funding. Okay. And then last, let's talk about growth. So insurance premiums, just, I, I guess, I imagine the amount you have outstanding is a critical driver for you. Right now you have about 150 million out. Where were you a year ago? Do you remember? I would say we were around 25 million. Okay. I mean, obviously impressive growth. What kind of additional growth channels did you open up to drive? What is that four or five, six X year over your growth? It's uh, adding more channels, companies like better, et cetera. Basically our thought is that 
you never buy home insurance, you actually buy a home. If you buy a home, you need a mortgage. If you need a mortgage, you need a home insurance. So we work with everybody that has to do with your home purchase. Realtors, mortgage guys, uh, title companies, inspection company, you name it. Uh, this These channels became really, really interesting for us. Mm -hmm. Now, 25 million out exactly a year ago, was that across about 25,000 customers at that point? Ballpark, I gave you the number is like 1200. So it's about that. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. I just want to make sure. So um, that makes good sense. Uh, obviously, growing the company. Um, what, uh, I mean, wh what is the next big kind of goal for you guys? Is additional product launches, getting some acquisitions done, you know, prepping to get, you know, get up to 100 million bucks in ARR? What is it? Uh, all of the above. You know, uh, <laughs> when do you think you, when do you think you'll pass 100 million? Can you do it next year? Or is that a little uncomfortable? Yeah, we'll do it next year. I'm talking in terms of what you, you're cut on the 1200. So you're 240. Yes. So just to be clear, you're saying if you add up all the 240, the cut you take on the 1200, you think you'll be above 100 million next year? Yes. Okay. Now, do you can you stay private or do you think you get some extra kind of credibility if you go public? It's an ongoing discussion. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, listen, I get the release. I'm the toughest interviewer. So I get the release story when you file before you file. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I like it. I probably told you like a lot more than I told uh, almost everybody else. This is good. People come on, they go, Nathan, I talked to the Wall Street Journal. You're way tougher than them. So, but if, you know what? I'm more fun. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> All right, man. Let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, favorite business book? Uh, Atlas Shrugged. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, Jeff Bezos. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your company? Gmail number exciting guy. Number four, how many, <laughs> how many hours of sleep to get every night? I'm, 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 I read, uh, on the, why you sleep book and I'm trying to be a lot more religious about that. I used to sleep like four five hours. Uh, and I'm trying to get the seven hours thing. It's not an easy thing for me. That's tricky. All right. What, what's your situation? Married, single kids. Married and an eight-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl. Okay, so two kiddos. And how old are you? 45. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? To stop pursuing entrepreneurship way earlier. Guys, start a company earlier. My Hippo just raised additional round of capital. Total capital at 209 million valuation over a billion. They get that valuation because they serve over 160,000 homeowners with uh, homeowners, or sorry, home insurance. Uh, they obviously upsell other products as well. So definitely doing north of 3.2 million per month right now in revenue up at least again, 4X year over year as their total kind of volume outstanding went from 25 million in premiums to 150 million in premiums. He says he's got good eyes on 100 million bucks in terms of revenue next year. And then from there, we will see what, happens us off. Thank you for taking us to the top. Thanks, Nathan.